I'm Georgina Geddes, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of CFO South Africa, and it is my privilege today to have a Q&A session with Ralph Mupita, uh, MTN CFO and CFO of the Year. Um, I had the, I've had the privilege of interviewing Ralph twice uh, before today, once for his CFO Awards uh, nomination interview, um, and another time for a follow-up interview of the awards. Last year I got to do the same with Christine Ramon, and by the time we invited her back to a third event, um, she said she doesn't even need to stand up, we can tell her story better than she would. <laughs> um, so I'm working on that with Ralph now. <laughs> After today, <laughs> I'll be your person. Um, so I thought we could jump right in the deep end. Um, you faced significant challenges early on. Um, after your appointment in 2017 and early 2018. Could you just share the stories, uh, story of really jumping in the deep end as a CFO? No, Georgina, thanks very much, and uh, good morning to everybody who is in the audience. And maybe a little bit of a preamble to your question. Um, as, you, as was noted earlier on, uh, I'm not a conventional, I haven't come through a conventional CFO path. And, um, you know, in late 2016, I had a call from uh, Putuma Antlek, who was then uh, the executive chair of MTN, uh, of MTN Group, and he invited me over for coffee. So I said, well, you know, it's Putuma, one of the people I look up to uh, in business. Uh, why wouldn't I have coffee with him? And, you know, the coffee discussion quickly evolved to a discussion about, you know, we'd like you to come and join us. And I had this discussion with him, but um, I think you already have a CEO that you've appointed, Rob Schuter, who I know very well. What are you thinking about? And he said, CFO. And I, I kind of balked a little bit. But, you know, long story short, I mean, as I was approaching, you know, the, the role, I did a lot of research um, and thinking through about MTN and where it's at, um, and also the industry where it's at. And a couple of things struck me just before I got into the role was that, firstly, there was a disruption to the core of the business. The voice business, the data business was going through some major transformation, broadly driven by what OTT businesses, e.g. Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, were doing to the economics of the business. So there was a disruption of the core, and I'd seen this in financial services before. The second thing I observed just before I came in was there was a lot of pressure on margins. The transition from voice to data, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, voice is a lot more profitable than data. Data is very capital intensive and actually quite difficult to monetize. So margins for operators were very much under pressure. The third observation I made was that there was much more intrusive regulatory uh, challenges uh, you know, within the telco sector in South Africa and more broadly across markets. So those three things really shaped kind of my entry coming into MTN when I started in April. And I remember before I started you know, kind of standing back and having a conversation you know, with Rob Shooter then and saying, over the next three years, I think these are my priorities within the CFO space, but more broadly as an executive. And, and, and some of the challenges were caught up in these priorities. I mean, the first was you know, to make sure that we had a world-class finance function and the talent in the business. Now, that's a journey that you never end, uh, but it's important to, to consciously think about that you know, within the CFO role. The second, challenge and priority was really around capital allocation. Now, between the CEO and the CFO, the most important thing um, that they have to be aligned on is their views on capital allocation. They can have many differences, but if they're different on capital allocation, you're going to have real big problems. And I think it's very difficult to steward and drive the, you know, the, um, you know, the ship forward. The third area we focused on, uh, I said I was going to focus on, was really around um, gearing. Gearing is a subset obviously of capital allocation, but you need to think about it differently. And in MTN situation, um, although at a group level we're moderately geared, a lot of our debt was sitting at the holdco level where there's no earnings being generated. Um, and we had to think through how we would make that transition. Um, cash upstreaming, because we operate in 21 markets, far-flung regions in the Middle East, uh, across Africa, for our group is a really big thing. And at the time I joined, there was quite a lot of work around upstreaming cash from Iran. Um, you know, the Iran sanctions then had been, um, had been wound back, and you, know, you could um, you know, repatriate capital and cash out. Um, so that was another priority. The um, two more priorities followed. One was really around to deal with um, 
the margin pressures, how do we think about cost efficiencies? You know, how do we think about investing uh, while saving at the same time so that we end up having a kind of financial profile where you know, revenue is growing faster than costs? And the final area was really around the development of an attractive investment case. Because a lot of the telcos were now being seen pretty much just as, um, as um, yield stocks. And there wasn't a sense that telcos can actually grow. And we had a vision that MTN was a business that had both the character characteristics of, of uh, growth and cash because of the uniqueness of the market stream. So a lot of the challenges were kind of shaped in there, but the big one, as I mentioned right up front, was you know, clarifying capital allocation because a telco business is very capital intensive. But uh, it's been a journey now, it's two and a half years, we're still working on some of those challenges. Okay, great. Um, and, 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 and I think kind of tangled up in one of those challenges was uh, the situation in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, and despite our best efforts, you didn't cancel your Nigerian listing to attend the CFO Awards. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so you actually weren't there to walk away with the four awards that you yeah. received on the night. Can you give us a little blow by blow of, of was your team WhatsApping you? How were you, how were you experiencing the moment? while not being there? No, look, it was a very um, difficult moment for us because actually the listing date moved twice. So when the, the original question of, are you attending, and I didn't know why I kept being asked, are you attending or not, came through, <laughs> I said, look, I think I may attend if the listing date moves, but we had to then lock down the listing date and then being 16th, I think, of May, which was the same date as the awards. So uh, it was very difficult to say no to what was probably this year, one of our, the biggest events for MTN Group, which was the listing of our biggest operation. So um, I had to make a choice and uh, you made it a little- <laughs> We lost. <laughs> you made it a little awkward for me, um, but I got a bit of a sense that something must be happening because when I did say to you that I can't make it, you said, well, let's do a video just in case you win. Um, and I found it very curious that mm, maybe I, there might be something that I might win. But yeah, the evening, if I go back to it, it was a very, um, yeah, it was a very interesting evening, very humbled, but very thrilled, particularly for my team, because uh, I work with an absolutely fantastic team. Some of them are here, so Ben Samuel somewhere, and Bonati is somewhere here. So it was a very interesting evening because two things were happening. We were busy with finalizing all the preparation for the listing the next day, and so we're having like last minute discussions with the Nigerian Stock Exchange, about are we gonna sell any shares to kind of do some market making, et cetera, and we said, no, it's a phone your board, whatever. And at the same time, I was getting pinged uh, WhatsApps. The first one came actually from my audit committee chair, uh, Christine Ramon. So I see Christine, I'm thinking, oh gosh, well, now what does the boss want now? <laughs> so, um, and they said, well, congratulations. I said, no, for what? And there was a word then. Um, so again, who runs our FinOps, he now pings me for another. So yeah, it was a great evening for sure. But for me, it's not re it wasn't really about me, you know, if I'll be honest, because, um, you know, the work really gets done by the team. And uh, for me, the fact that the team were there and they were able to pick up the, um, the awards, to me, meant a whole lot more uh, because um, very little gets done by an individual. You know, great things, you know, only get done by teams. Okay. Good. Um, and a little bit more about your background. Um, John's already mentioned that you, you don't come from a traditional... Uh, CA working your way up through the ranks background. Um, so tell us a little bit about your growth path to get where you were today. Yeah, my life is a story of accidents. Uh, my wife tells me, tells me that the only thing that I mustn't say is accidents ma is marrying her. So <laughs> I think uh, to stay safe. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I trained as an engineer. I mean, I'm, I'm a civil engineer by training. Um, and, um, but I've had to uh, reinvent myself several times. So, you know, in the late 90s, there wasn't much happening in terms of infrastructure builds. Got a little bored, um, you, know, you know, doing my engineering thing. Uh, applied for an MBA. I uh, had plans to work in investment banking uh, and um, also in, um, um, in asset management, funnily enough. And I got rejected, uh, you know, both. And I always say to people, rejection is often a gift because uh, I then ended up in, uh, at Old Mutual and, uh, you know, then, you know, spent 17 years in financial services. So that was, uh, you know, one transition. So coming to, to MTN has been another transition. Um, but, you know, I, I look at myself and, 
And in my own kind of self-reflection, the kind of deeper self-reflection is, I do see myself not, you know, uh, I don't pigeonhole myself and say, I am an engineer, or I am this and that. I mean, I think of myself more about the skills I can bring to a situation, the skills I can bring to a context. And my skills are really about problem solving. Um, you know, my engineering training taught me how to think about problems, you know, how to look at the complexity of a problem and then, you know, fix an element of the problem and then solve the other bits. Because maybe the problem's got too many indeterminants. So you have to think about where do you start with the problem. So that's the first thing. The second thing that the engineering taught me is pattern recognition. Because engineers are not, particularly civil engineers, are not very precise people, but they're taught to, you know, to look at trends and to look at discontinuities in trends. Um, and then they're taught, importantly, um, you know, to, you know, to trust the data. But as, I, as I've grown, I've realized that you just don't need data, you need intuition. I think uh, Steve Jobs said the same thing, that intuition is more important than intellect. But that comes often with time, and when you're younger, you don't really see that thing. So my transition wasn't, uh, you know, to, to the industry was also, you know, it's, it's, I had two transitions to deal with. The first is to the industry transitions, which I'd done, but I also importantly had to do another transition which is completely unusual. Well, mostly unusual, I can't say completely because I've done it and many others have done it. Is to move from being a CEO to a CFO. Now, when you're a CEO, you're used to you know, making the final calls, you look, you're used to operating mostly at 30,000 foot coming down to the ground. Um, but that transition is very unusual. And uh, I guess in the first 18 months, there was a bit of a rewiring of the brain that had to happen from my side. But, you know, you know, the thing about life is, again, never, you know, you know pigeon or, or, or rather kind of fixate about what, what you are and what your skills are. I mean, think more broadly. Okay. Um, and then a big question that often comes up is, but he's not a CA. Um, and we all know that it's not a legal requirement for a CFO to be a CA, but how, do you, how, do you, how did you make your peace with that? Because I know that it was part of your balking, was that you uh, had to come to terms with not having what you would imagine the perfect CV for the role is. Yeah, as I mentioned, the tea or coffee I had with Putuma was like um, a bit of a shock, but within a day or two, I kind of wrapped my head around it. Well, I always say to people, you're not a CIA, I said, but I'm married to one, so maybe that counts for something. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when IFRS 16 comes, I have to say, listen, what's, you know, help me with this so I don't look stupid when I get to work. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, when you think about it, coming back to how do you see and frame yourself, South Africa and the UK in particular have this obsession that CAs are the only people who can do finance. So it's, it's, it's those two markets in particular. You go to the US, you're gonna see a lawyer as a CFO, okay? Not even an engineer. You could, you could argue that maybe an engineer plays around with numbers, can look at trends, really understand statistics, but their lawyers were CEOs of uh, Fortune uh, 100 companies. You go to Europe, you see that. You go to the Nordic regions, you see that. You go to Asia, you see that. So it, it is very idiosyncratically a South African and UK issue. When, when they don't see a CA, it's like, ah, you know? So, yeah, you know? So, I mean, I'm comfortable in my own skin about what I know and I don't know, and I don't know, I ask people. And as I said, I've got a great team. Um, when I don't know something about IFRS 6, and I go to Ben Samuel, I go to Lauren and our team, I don't have to know everything. But I, what, what I do need to know is the frame, as I, as I spoke about earlier, the six things that created the framework of how I situate the CFO role, those things I need to be supremely, uh, you know, in understanding and confident about. But the detail, I have a team. That's the whole point of a team. Yeah. So South Africa is very really obsessed with that. And, and the problem with that also is, and I saw it when I was an engineer, uh, where engineers like other engineers, okay, is that you have a breeding of the same kind of thinking, okay? Uh, so you, you develop the group think. Um, so I worked through it in my own head, and actually the, the when I kind of had conceptually you know, reflected in my wife, I said, now nah, I think it's a good idea. You, you know, you're a crazy guy, you keep reinventing yourself, so why should you, now, you know, struggle now? I remember the, one of my kind of, I don't know whether it's heroes or mentors, I don't, I'm not sure what the, quite the framing is, but a guy called T. Jan Thiem, who's currently now the CEO of Credit Suisse. Now he's, he's from Cote d'Ivoire, he was born in Cote d'Ivoire, he worked at McKinsey, he left McKinsey, uh, went to work for the government in Cote d'Ivoire in economic planning. 
Then he went to Prudential and Aviva. He was a CEO and then became a CFO for two years. So I said, ah, oh, but he can do it. He also is an engineer MBA like myself. So often when you see people like yourself, all of a sudden it becomes possible. Mm. So when I looked at TJ and Theo, I said, well, he did it. Well, oh, what's the big deal? And this um, chairman of mine thinks I can do it as well. So yeah, let me know. So I think, as I said, the critical team is that you have a world-class team, which I'm blessed to have. And you can make it happen. And also, you know, it's, it's okay to look a little bit foolish and not know what's going on. Um, because at least you're always not um, taking things for granted. Um, I tell a lot of people who work in my office or come and work with me um, that one of the important things in life is, and I think Steve Jobs said it best when he said, you know, stay hungry, stay foolish. So the, the stay foolish part is, you know, always be learning, always be questioning, always be skeptical, always depend on others. You know, you can't see yourselves as the only kind of, you know, you know all-knowing. And um, so, yeah, as I said, you know, it's a very South African, UK issue, but maybe we'll create a trend in South Africa now. Well, I think you're showing the way. Um, and, there, uh, and that's, that's um, it's good to have, as you say, figures of inspiration. Yeah. Um, so hopefully maybe you can create that same inspiration for f a future, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> a future generation of engineer CFOs. Um, However, you have mentioned that you've got a lot of um, a world-class team, um, some of whom are made up of younger finance professionals. I'm assuming a lot of them are CAs, but some of them might not be. Um, what are the characteristics that stand out for you uh, among your team or among young CAs? Who, who are those who are going to be successful? That's a really deep and profound question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that. But as I reflect, and maybe it's, it's more about, it, it goes beyond just the domain of young folk who are CAs, it's just young folk who are gonna be successful as I see them. And I have a lot of them I see in my team who I believe are gonna be heading institutions in time. They, they might not see it of themselves, but I certainly see it in them. The first thing that I see is curiosity. People who are curious, people who ask lots of questions on why. And, and a lot of people say, but surely that's obvious. And I'm, I say that having worked in corporate um, South Africa, curiosity is something that actually is in short supply. People aren't, there's a hierarchy that says, because Ralph said something, or Rob said something in our world, it must be true, okay? So you don't get challenged. But I see young people who are curious and, and you know, they will respectfully do that, and they will tell you, but I think you're wrong, okay? And what I like about that is I say, you know, this is somebody who is curious, independent thinking. They are always looking to develop themselves, but that they are self-driven in that development. And some of them come and approach me, can you be my mentor? Uh, or can you help me figure this thing out? So can, coming back to this foolish, uh, you know, stay hungry, stay foolish theme, um, what they do often is they take themselves, and this is to me quite important for growth, they take themselves out of comfort zones. They try, they, they, they move out of finance, they go try something else. They know that they center the, the, the solid part of the T, that they have for sure is finance of their CA, but they're looking for breath, because that breath will allow them to you know, eventually be better executives. Um, even if they remain in finance, they will understand the value chain, understand the ecosystem more deeply. So I would say curiosity, uh, you know, challenging. There's different ways of challenging. You can do it respectfully. But I say, I find people and I like it when they say, I think you're wrong, and here's why. And I say, you know, please bring the data. Um, they are, they are, they are self-driven and, and they manage themselves well. Um, those ingredients I found are super important for growth. And whether you're a CEO or you're not a CA, you know, you ultimately can see somebody who's going to get far. But that aspects of curiosity, um, you know, is, and, and, pu and pushing yourself out a little bit. Um, Ray Dalio is another you know, person that I listen to his podcast and read his books. Uh, often says that. Um, you know, growth only comes through uh, pain and reflection. And pain comes from stretching yourselves beyond your comfort zones. So, yeah, I've got, we got, we're blessed at MTN. We have these young folk who are doing exactly that. Okay, great. Um, and then a little bit more talking shop. Um, what, are the, what are the opportunities you're seeing for um, MTN in South Africa? And why did that make you the right guy for the job? 
yeah, I'm not always sure that I'm the right guy for the job. <laughs> Own it. <laughs> uh, you, know, you, always have, you have to have a little bit of self-doubt all the time. Um, look, in South Africa, there, there, there are some fundamental issues that the industry is facing, but more broadly, uh, an issue that is with, you know, um, a, uh, a concern for the, for the country. I think the big thing is really around industry structure. South Africa, you know, the telco industry is a very capital intensive business. The last couple of years as MTN, we're putting anywhere between you know, nine to 11 and a half, call it 12 billion rand, let's round the numbers up, of capex every single year. Um, and you know, our competitors also put a lot of capex. The big thing is the, you know, the industry structure needing to be, uh, you know, to, you know, to have some susten uh, sustainability in it. You have two fully um, uh, vested networks in Vodacom and MTN, and then you have hybrid networks in South Sea and Telcom because they roam on the, on the two fully vested networks. That's an industry structure which is quite unique and actually you don't see it in too many other markets. So there are industry structure issues that are at play and you know, there's a lot that's been written about uh, the competition commission's view on the industry structure. So that's also you know, a set of issues for the industry. The second is the cost to communicate. And the cost to communicate debate and discussion has got some false narratives all over it, uh, which aren't really helpful. It's a lot of heat without much insight. Because the real issue was you know, about you know, you know, data is too expensive. A big part of it is that in South Africa, as we sit here, we have not released you know, high demand spectrum, which is key and important for um, bringing the cost to communicate down. The 700 uh, megahertz spectrum, the 800, 2600, uh, has been coming for over de a decade. Now, I, we, we got 21 markets, and in many markets, everyone talks, you know, they've been exploiting 800 megahertz spectrum for years. So, there is for sure a need to bring the cost to communicate down, but a big driver of that, and companies can stop spending as much capex as they is the release of that spectrum. So that's a big industry issue. And then the, the final big issue that we face in South Africa is ensuring that it's linked to the cost of communication is the fourth industrial revolution. How do we ensure that South Africa does not get left behind in this? Because the world's moving, particularly in the Northern uh, Hemisphere, the developed markets are moving ahead. So those are some of the, the issues that we see and we think that we can bring solutions, you know, not just ourselves as MTN, but the other telecommunications providers. Um, and so we pre feel pretty excited, but for sure there are challenges, but these challenges can be overcome. Okay, great. And you yourself, what do you use your phone for? What is your, what's your biggest addiction? Yeah, I would <laughs> say you have three pages often on your phone. Um, and I, 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 I think about the usage of my apps in kind of three big buckets. The kind of productivity tools, your usual you know, spreadsheets, um, I read Word doc on my phone. I've got used to now actually, you know, using my phone for pretty much everything that, you know, people use on a, on a PC, laptop, because uh, you've got your full suite of productivity, let's say Microsoft tools, that's one. I can, I can just live off my phone without ever having to pull out my, um, you know, my, my, my PC. Second, obviously, I mean, I do all my financial services on my phone. I haven't been in a bank, a bank branch, I think for maybe three years. I just went into my bank and they've changed. They're more like this yeah, <laughs> and less like people like behind this. glass. But I was astonished. I don't know when that happened. Yeah, no, I don't, I've, <laughs> I, I don't, I've, I've, I've not felt the need to go to a bank and I haven't, I haven't been one for years. So all my financial services I do um, on my phone. Um, social media, obviously, I'm not very active in social media, um, but you know, to keep in touch with family, etc. we always have a WhatsApp group as a family. So um, a little bit of social media, and then I, I, and I do a lot of my reading there as well. So I'm, I'm you know, whatever news um, and magazines are on my phone. Those are the broad buckets. Um, but I'm not, my boss would like me to be more active on uh, social media, but I think mm, that's for somebody else, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Your world-class team, <laughs> put yeah, them out yeah. there. Um, 
so you're not a CA, and another thing that you're not is a typical South African, because you were born in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, you spent more than half your life here, and you're, you have a South African wife and South African children. Um, how, do you, how do you see yourself? How does, what, is, what is the identity? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, th this identity thing really hit me one time. We were traveling to a destination. I got four kids, and um, and uh, my wife, and then they got. I got pulled aside at an airport. I won't mention, and uh, and I had to tell them that we're like one family. You know, there isn't us and them or whatever. So we all one. Look, I mean, the way I think of myself, I think of myself as an African first. And I think you've got to figure out how your self-definition. These borders are very artificial. And I'll tell you two little stories that tell you about the artificialness of these borders. And one of them, pretty recent, actually, is my first trip to Kenya, when I landed, somebody greets me and he said, where are you going? And he said, Kupita, Kupita. My surname, Kupita, uh, means the one who moves from place to place. So I arrived there. This guy says, Kupita, Kupita. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, you're the guy who moves from place to place. I said, yeah, OK. I'm sitting out here in Nairobi. Somebody knows what my surname means. <laughs> now, I've had that experience in Mozambique. I've had the experience in Malawi. I've had that experience in DRC. Now, I've had that experience with that same question about where are you going. I had that experience in Abuja a few weeks ago. So this one of our colleagues uh, in the Abuja office runs up to me. You know, Mr. Mapita, how are you, et cetera, et cetera. I just wanted to tell you that your surname means something in Hausa. Now, Hausa is a language in Nigeria. Um, and I said, what does it mean? He says, the one who moves from place to place. Okay. That's amazing. So my definition is not, I mean, I was born in Zimbabwe, and I'm very proud that, um, of, of where I came from, my parents and my heritage. But I, I see myself as an African. I see my family as Africans. Uh, and we have these artificial borders that don't help. But I've, as you say, I've pretty much, you know, from 19, I've been living in South Africa. So, uh, you know, I, I don't try and think about the border stuff too much. Um, it, 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 it doesn't help. I think it uh, conflates and makes things more challenging uh, and creates an us in there. But um, I travel with my South African passport. I've been here long enough. Uh, so I don't get harassed anymore at the airport. Separated uh, from your family. <laughs> <laughs> Searched. Yeah. Um, that said, I do think that you can um, observe regional differences um, in different areas from political backgrounds and cultural, cultural norms. Um, are, there, are there some kind of inspirational cultures or business experiences that you've had in other places in Africa that you would hold up as something that we could all learn from? No, I think, I think we're similar in many ways, actually. There's more that binds us than makes us different. And often as human beings, we focus on the differences rather than the things that are. As I traipse the continent, and actually in the Middle East, there are a lot of similarities is, uh, around kind of culture, nuances, ways of doing business. The one thing that I think is probably acceptable in the Western world, which is quite difficult you know, to be successful as an executive if you, if you don't observe this in Middle East and Africa, is the issue of face. Okay. Um, the thing about Africans right from here all the way up north is people don't want to be humiliated. They, want to be f they don't want to feel stupid um, because they've suffered so much humiliation in their history, some of it driven by colonialism, etc. I find that whatever way you need to drop and deliver your point, you must do it in a way that does not um, impinge on a person's dignity. That thing on the continent, so incorrectly, South Africans are often seen on the continent as they're abrasive, they're arrogant. But what they actually mean is that the person is not sensitive to the situation. So I know for a fact, so I'll give you a little example. If, I'm, if there's an issue with a regulator in country X, um, and they need to make sure that they get their, they're going to interact with us, I need to first of all make sure that I, I deeply have understanding of the issue and why it's important to that particular country. And I need to situate myself in their shoes. Secondly, I then need to figure out how do I deliver my message firmly without any wavering, but in a way that does not react in the person losing face, okay? And, and it's very achievable, but you have to situate yourself in their shoes. So what I find on the continent, which is more as opposed to difference is common, is the issue of face, dignity, being respectful, 
Don't be arrogant, even if you know, and you know that person doesn't know. Don't ever show them that they don't know. There's no price for that. But the only thing that you'll do is you will bring people's emotions out where they say you're arrogant, etc. So focus on the outcome, but be respectful in all of that. And to your question about where do we find good examples, I mean, I love the continent. I'm comfortable everywhere. I mean, I think it's, it'll be difficult to say country X, Y, and Z. And maybe some of the people from some of those countries are sitting in the audience, <laughs> so they might get offended or whatever. But I, I mean, as I said, I just love the continent, and I know there's difficulties. There, it's not a perfect, um, you know, um, you know, continent. But to me, the, the issue is you know, be respectful to people, um, and never diminish. Don't make people lose face. Um, and you can achieve much, uh, you know, on the continent with that. Okay, great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, you work very closely with Rob, and you yourself have served as a CEO. Um, what would you say are the elements of a successful CEO-CFO relationship? Yeah, I, I get asked that question quite a lot, and I often think of the analogy of a rally car rather than a Formula One car, because a rally car has two, driver, uh, has two people in the car. There's a driver and, and then there's a navigator. Um, I think you need to, first of all, establish a partnership. And it, it needs to be a, a, a healthy and respectful partnership. You, you don't have to be sending uh, Christmas cards to each other, okay? But you have to be respectful and, and believe you have a partnership, step number one. Step number two, as I mentioned, CFO, CEO, key thing, you need to have an aligned view on capital allocation. The most important decisions one makes in these roles really relate to leadership and capital allocation. Everything else is detail. If you get those two things wrong, and you don't have the relationship right between CEO and CFO, how do you think about leading the organization? You need to be on the same page. How do you think about capital allocation? You need to be on the same page. Everything else is up for grabs. So with Rob, th those two points, the partnership, the leadership philosophy and style, the capital allocation, 100% aligned. Uh, I think you need in independence and interdependence. Independence because the CFO often in a board situation has to slightly distance himself from the CEO on matters that are more uh, 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 akin to kind of financial stewardship of the company. The board, in a board seating or a discussion around dividend sustainability, um, etc., the board is going to veer to the CFO, uh, not the CEO. So that's where you need to be independent to say, you know, I have a different view on this, but the way we came to agree on this way forward was the following. So you need to assert your independence as well. But then importantly, linked to the partnership thing, showed the interdependence that, you know, we, we have to work with, it, with, with each other and we do that. And I think you have to have a healthy, um, critical relationship as well. Now, what I mean by that is um, sometimes I come back to the group thing, the danger of group thinkers. If you're all yes, 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 I think there's a lot that gets um, lost and it can be a very dangerous territory for decision making. So Rob and I argue a lot, you know, we argue to the, and, but we argue really about issues. And I always say to people, arguing about issues or fighting on issues, always welcome anytime. Um, because no one has a monopoly on the truth. So you're always working with shades of gray Never anything black and white. If it was black and white, it would be easy. So it's always shades of gray you're working with. And so the answers aren't always obvious and clear. So you need to, to make a decision. Now, what is interesting is Rob's style and skills and mine, I think, are different but complementary. You know, Rob is very good with detail, and he will remember every number, every number. Liberia EBITDA margin today, if you ask me, I'm probably going to forget it. But Rob will know it. Um, so he's very... I'm much more a, a wood guy. My wiring is much more the wood. I see the wood. I can work at ground zero, but I can also, um, you know, I, I'm better at looking for the problems and the trends. So we end up complementing each other. So he, he is much, much better than I on the detail. I think I have an ability, humbly so to say, that I probably see the forest better than he does. So it ends up complementing and working, you know, so yeah, pretty good. 
Okay. And then you gave me a, a, a nice lead into a fun question I had prepared, and I had to prepare it because it's not my area at all, which is um, you're a big Formula One fan, yeah. and you told me that you watch like an engineer. So can you give us an engineer's insight into the current Formula One races that are on the horizon? No, I don't want to bore the, the <laughs> finest people here <laughs> with my own passions, but suffice to say you're right. I mean, I love uh, Formula One. As I said, I was trained as an engineer, so there's aspects of the way I think and I look at the world, which is completely wide around, you know, the, the way, you know, engineers look at. Yeah, I mean, I've been following Formula One, you know, you know pretty much since I was 10 years old. So you can see with the white beard that I'm, I'm like many, many years from uh, being 10. Um, yeah, the thing I like about Formula One, which I can bring as an analogy to the work environment or even MTN where I'm at, is it's predominant. It's actually a team sport. You know, you see if you're Lewis Hamilton or Valtteri Bottas or Charles Leclerc, them getting into the cockpits of their car, it is fundamentally a team sport. Um, and everybody has to play their part to win. You know, the chassis engineers, the engine engineers, if, if the guys don't get it all right, you know, you, you, know, you, you, can't, um, you, know, you, you can't succeed. So, yeah, I, I, I enjoy Formula One. I'm a... Mercedes fans, so to all the Ferrari fans, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I like uh, Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> and what I like about it is that if you're into it, and many people are not into it, and I bore my friends when I talk about it, I said, no, people just, you just go round and round and round and round and round. Now, what can be exciting about that? But I mean, every circuit is different. You know, there are circuits with straights, so the cars with straight line speed um, are better. Then they're, you know, in a, in, a, in a circuit that doesn't have as many straight line speeds, it's got, you know, more chicanes and curves, actually the chassis design matters more where you have more downforce. Because downforce, you know, the downforce of a Formula One car is like an upside down airplane. So it's stuck to the ground. And that's why those guys can take, um, you know, corners at 180 k's an hour. And what you also learn from, engin uh, from Formula One beyond the team sport is optimization. So on a track, you're always trying to optimize speed with downforce. Uh, but you can't have both, okay? And <laughs> so it teaches you much in life that in life, you're always going to have to optimize and make trade-offs. So that's the other lesson I pick up uh, as I'm looking at the, the car, what, what's doing, which circuit. So last week, Mercedes did well in Suzuka. I think the Mexican Grand Prix probably favors the Ferraris. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm very passionate about that. Everyone's allowed to be passionate about one thing that everyone else might not like. Yeah, thanks, Ralph, uh, for the comments. Uh, very insightful. Um, normally, this question is asked to CIOs and uh, business people and product people. But uh, as the, a leader of finance of a major corporation um, in South Africa and more globally, um, what are your views on the opportunities for fintech in South Africa? And keep, maybe keep it to South Africa for a moment or Sub-Saharan Africa, if you want to comment on that geography as well. Thank you. No, I'm super excited about the opportunity for fintech. I mean, that's one of the reasons I joined MTN because I come from financial services and I had this belief and still have the belief that the future is going to be on the, uh, on the mobile phone. The, you know, there's going to be a lot. There already is a lot, but uh, you know, a lot more is coming onto the, onto the phone. Um, when we look across our markets, we have about 240 million subscribers at MTN across our markets. You know, only 80%, uh, sorry, 80 million are using data, and only 30 million are, you know, are subscribers on our mobile money platforms. So in sub-Saharan Africa, what we see is that financial inclusion is still a big issue. And what the banks have struggled to do, and I know this world very well because I spent, as I said, 17 years in financial services. What financial services struggle with is what we call the capillarity of distribution. How close can you get to every individual um, you know, who has a home, um, whether deep in the rural areas? And the one thing that telecommunication has above banks is that distribution, is the depth of that distribution. So we see one third of sub-Saharan Africans you know, being financially included. So we see a big opportunity to be able to connect them, uh, you know, to finance and you know, bring them along uh, you know, into the world of financial services. Um, so we've we got about 30 million 30-day uh, um, active uh, subscribers um, across our markets, and we see this as a massive growth opportunity for our business, uh, more broadly in sub-Saharan Africa. 
In South Africa, there's still an opportunity. It is not as big as we may see, let's say, Nigeria or Ghana, because banking is well developed here, as is insurance. But there's still two economies in one in South Africa, for sure. Big cash economies, a lot of money under mattresses, money that is moving in pretty much just the cash economy. And we think we can provide a better than cash solution uh, in South Africa. And you know, many of you would have heard that we have aspirations in South Africa to, to launch, to relaunch mobile money. And we think we've got the formula right this time. So there's a big opportunity there for sure, and we're super excited about that. Uh, and uh, watch this space over the next uh, two to three years.